We are Pro Cannabis Media. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a special edition of In the Weeds with Jimmy Young. And today we are joined by the CEO and co-founder of a company called Kushko. Now, if you happen to study those penny stocks on some of those interesting exchanges out there, you might actually find Kushko listed. Nick Kovacevic. Did I get it right, Nick Kovacevic? You got it. You got it. All that Is practice. Thank you very much. He's our he's the CEO. He joins us from California. Nick, thank you so much for coming on today. And you know, being a publicly traded company in the cannabis ancillary space is challenging, isn't it? Absolutely. Uh, you know, look, it's not anywhere near as challenging as the companies that we service, which are the businesses that touch the plant. But right. nonetheless, I mean, we've been shut down by dozens and dozens of banks uh, with the business and personally, right? All this scrutiny. And at the end of the day, you know, we're just selling packaging and supplies, um, but people see the cannabis affiliation and, and they bring the hammer down and it's tough. So we've, we've navigated this, you know, for almost a decade now, uh, believe it or not. Uh, so we're pretty used to it. And we thought things would be a little better by now, but, you know, unfortunately, you know, without getting uh, some of these uh, laws passed like the Safe Banking Act, you know, we really haven't seen the progress we've all hoped for. From a business perspective, I think is you are accurate. And plus, you're in a mature market of California. You know, I'm coming to you from Massachusetts, where legalization was voted in four years ago. And this week, just the second dispensary for adult use was opened in Boston this past week, four years later. So we have Pure Oasis and we have Berkshire Roots now open in the city of Boston four years after the voters brought it in. So while we well, while you can take a step back, Nick, and I'm much older than you, and I can see tremendous progress being made, okay, you're right, from your perspective in a mature market with a company with a pretty decent cap table, I checked you out, uh, it is a challenge. And yes, even this little company had their bank account shut down when we took money from a dispensary. So I feel like I broke my cherry in the cannabis business a little bit too. Um, how Again, let's go back to the Safe Banking Act because I'm very familiar with it. I know that it passed the United States House of Representatives with flying colors and bang, it goes to the Senate and those Republicans, they're the ones who shut it down. In fact, not only are they shutting that down, but any mention of cannabis in a COVID relief bill now is getting nixed. There is, it is amazing to me that it is now a political chip in it, when it has to do with public health more than anything else, public health and public safety. And now we've got Republicans against Democrats. How frustrating is that for you? You know, it's, it's uh, incredibly frustrating. And actually I've spent a lot of time, um, you know, in the political world as part of my role here. And, you know, I, I uh, met with a lot of the prominent uh, leaders uh, on, on both sides of the aisle, but particularly uh, on the Republican side, given that, you know, they're kind of the main roadblock right now. And, uh, Cor Senator Cory Gardner out of Colorado, his name is on the Safe Banking Act, which is now stalled right. in the Senate. And he's trailing big time in the polls to, to former Governor Hickenlooper. And I was on a Zoom call with, with Senator Gardner a couple weeks ago. And I said, hey, look, you know, Senator, me and, and other folks in our industry have supported you. You've done a tremendous job advocating uh, for our industry, which is completely true. He has. But I said, uh, a lot of people are starting to lose faith because it doesn't seem like your party is going to support what's important to not only our industry, but also to you. You're behind in the polls. This Safe Banking Act uh, could really give you a big lift coming down the stretch here. I said, you know, what do I tell my colleagues in the cannabis industry that are saying, hey, we love Corey, but he hasn't got it done. Uh, maybe it's time to jump ship and, 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 and look about, think about flipping the Senate in November, right? What do I tell these folks? So that's the challenge is, is even though we have some good people on both sides of the aisle that support our issue, it has become a, a chip, as you say, and there's people that are digging their heels in saying, we're not gonna give an inch on this issue, which has so much broad support. I mean, you're talking 70% to 80% of the people in this country want cannabis legalized, and we can't even get a, a small fraction of movement uh, in certain bodies of the government. It's very frustrating. 
Very frustrating indeed. Um, in fact, I saw a Republican senator from South Dakota come out and basically say uh, anything that has cannabis attached to it in the COVID relief fund, they don't want to have anything to do with it. Now, again, this has become a public safety concern. It has to do with banking. It has to do with health. And for some reason, that does not compute with some people who dig their heels in. I just don't understand. Isn't the role of a representative or a senator in government to do what the people that elect them ask them to do? Isn't that what democracy in a republic is? Did I miss something in college? You know, you're, you're exactly right. And I've been... Uh harping on this over the last uh, couple months, actually. Um, and, you know, really, uh, the call to action is, is getting people to vote. And a lot of people are, are uh, becoming more aware uh, that, you know, th that, yeah, we have people in office that really aren't reflecting what we the people want. And the only way to fix that is to change the people that are in the office. November is going to be, I think, a huge turnout. Um, COVID obviously is a, is, a, is a little bit of a wild card. But uh, one thing that we did is actually on June 12th, we announced that we're giving the entire company a paid day off, the full day, right? We're going to eliminate all excuses and allow our employees to be able to get out and go vote, volunteer at the polling stations if they, if they feel inclined to, right? They've got the full day paid. We're encouraging other companies to follow suit. Several other cannabis companies have reached out to me saying that they're adopting the same policy. Even large companies like Twitter have announced they're giving the day paid off. So this is a movement of people kind of becoming aware that um, we're not being re represented by our government, which is the whole point, as you say, studying history of, of the how this country was founded was to give uh, representation to the constituents. And when you have an issue like cannabis, it's very clear 70% of people support it for adult use, upwards of 90 seven percent supported for medical and we can't get either of those across the finish line something is wrong here and we need change and i believe we will get some change in november because of the way that people are now motivated not only on this issue but on several other issues throughout the country now certainly and, and it's good to hear it from someone like yourself who isn't just running his company he's actually um, taking it to another level, you have a conscience. You, you really want to do, do right by your employees and by the, uh, in the industry that you're in. You know, it's one of the most fascinating things I found about the people in the cannabis industry is their true passion for this cause. And, you know, you've, you told me, you've already paid your dues. You know, you've had bank accounts shut down. You've probably had personal accounts uh, taken away or shut down or moved or whatever. Um, there's, there's nothing like this industry in history. No comparables out there right now. We're all kind of paving the way in this historical end to prohibition. And I'm, I am cautiously optimistic, but when I read about what's going on in some other these states and I see some of the actions by the true leader of us, I really am concerned. I really am. And I'm much older than you. I don't have much more time left. I want to see if we can actually get this thing done already. Yeah. No, I, and I think, it, you know, November could clear that path, right? And, that, and people, people feel that. Um, if, if it doesn't, you know, things don't change in November, you know, it might be four more years of, of cannabis, people getting locked up for cannabis. I don't know if you saw the other day, but uh, there's a gentleman who's an ex-military veteran, happens to be black. In Alabama, where I'm going to be talking months, about. Yep. To for medical marijuana, which, first of all, would never happen to a white person. But secondly, it shouldn't happen to anybody. Ex today, in his, today's day, day and age, with 33 states that have legal medical right. marijuana, it's, it's absurd. Right. Well, it's because, you know, we've allowed racism to exist under the under the guise of the Civil Rights Act, under the guise of a lot of this. And this couple, I read the whole story, I, it, they had their music on too loud and that attracted a law enforcement person. And, and I, you know, and what happened? He asked, can I search your car? And the guy said, yeah, of course, why not? I, if, you know, he didn't even think that, oh, I'm a medical, I got medical cannabis in my car. I mean, you know, again, this is what the problem is. And by the way, 
How many of those stories have you heard? And I'm sure you know about The Last Prisoner Project and Steve D'Angelo coming from California. He has dedicated the rest of his life to expunging the records of anyone incarcerated for cannabis crimes. So, uh, so tremendous uh, uh, organization and, and got to commend, uh, you know, the D'Angelo's for all the work that they're, they're doing and have done and continue to do. Um, you know, one one organization that we're involved in is Mission Green, which is the story of Weldon Angelos, who uh, was uh, as a young adult um, caught, you know, a couple times dealing to a federal officer undercover small amounts. I mean, the total amount when you add it up was less than a thousand dollars worth of marijuana. Um, but yeah. because he had a gun on him and because it was several occurrences, he ended up with a mandatory minimum of 55 years. Yeah. Uh, the judge that gave it to him even said, this doesn't feel right, but I have to give you this 55 years. He had two kids. I mean, just terrible. Luckily, I mean, he had, it was the most incredible story. Uh, people like the Koch brothers on one side of the aisle, Republicans, uh, on the other side of the aisle, you had Snoop Dogg and you had a Cory Booker all came to support. And finally, they got him out after 12 years. There's a big documentary coming out on um, HBO. Uh, I think it's done by Mark Wahlberg around his story. My name is Weldon Angelos. In 2002, I was arrested in a sting operation for selling less than $1,000 worth of cannabis. I was forced to trial and I lost. Due to the mandatory minimum sentencing laws, I was sentenced to a 55-year prison term. I lost my career as a music producer. I lost my family. I lost the chance to raise my two sons for selling less cannabis than the current personal use limit in California. When I began serving my time, I never thought I would end up walking out those doors 13 years later. When I walked out those prison doors, I knew that I wanted to dedicate my life to helping those in situations like myself who did not have the luck that I did. This is my mission green. Through our specialized programming and initiatives, we aim to create change by providing relief to those who are still serving sentences for cannabis offenses, creating reentry programs for those who are integrating back into society after serving these sentences, assisting those who do not have access to legal counsel, and by working with policymakers on the local, state, and federal level to change the system at its core to prevent what happened to me from happening to others. This is an issue that affects all American families. This is Mission Green. Please join the movement. Go to theweldenproject.org to learn how to get involved. And this is something that um, we're supporting, but similar mission to Last Prisoner Project with the idea of how do we get everybody else out? Weldon got out, fortunately but that's not enough for him. Now he wants uh, to get everybody else out. So it's great to see people doing this, but you know, look, I grew up, uh, funny story, I grew up, my dad was a prosecutor and a judge. So, you know, at one point before I was born, he was putting people in prison for as you know, a little as a joint. Um, right. And obviously times have, have changed a, a little bit, but one thing I learned from him was uh, when somebody asked to search your car, the answer is always no. Uh, because you have the right to say no. And <clears throat> it's just sad that a lot of people think, hey, you know, why not? I don't have anything bad. Why not? Well, bad things can somehow happen even when you don't think you're in the wrong. And so to anybody out there listening, the answer should always be no. I mean, wh why? We, there's no need. Um, we're all just trying to live our lives and, and have our own personal freedoms. And we don't need people intruding on that, one, especially when we have a right to tell them no. Right. And, and eventually the laws will catch up with our own individual rights. And I, I really do believe that. And, you know, you got to realize you're in California and I'm in Massachusetts. Are there, there these are two pretty liberal communities, let's face it, Nick, you know, uh, you know, it all started, that revolution back in the 18th century started in, in this area. Remember that it was uh, uh, something about representation without taxation. And now here you are in an industry who wants the taxation, okay, just to get it legitimized, just to get this thing going uh, once, once and for all. Tell me a little bit about Kushko, please, because I, I feel like we've gotten into a political discussion because of my passion and your passion for this. But tell me a little bit about your company, how it started, and, I, and I'm intrigued with the fact that you are a truly an ancillary cannabis business because your company does not touch the plant. You're just working with the people who do. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we, you know, we started, uh, as we were talking before the show, uh, you know, we're coming up on our 10 year anniversary here in, in December. And so we started pretty early. It was in California. It was the medical marijuana market, uh, which was the earliest 
medical marijuana market started in 1996. And we came on the scene in 2010 and we each had one goal and, and it was really to be able to support the dispensaries that needed these packaging goods. Um, we started with selling child resistant vials and we thought, hey, this is an industry that's um, it's, it's new, it's, uh, it's emerging, there's not a lot of infrastructure and support. Um, but it's also something that needs to professionalize and destigmatize. And so we thought, hey, bringing a pharmaceutical grade option, right, child resistant, and getting ahead of some of the, the, the concerns and fears that, you know, parents around the country would, would have when they hear about pot coming to their, uh, you know, coming to a dispensary near their, near their house. Uh, we thought this was a great opportunity to you know, solve a real problem, provide value and service, um, but also help push uh, the the right narrative that people should be thinking about is is cannabis as uh, a real industry, a professional industry. So it was a it was a great combination. It wasn't easy, uh, and you know it took several years for you know the business to to kind of materialize. Then Colorado legalized. Now we had the first state that required regulation for their packaging, and guess what? They wanted everything to be child resistant. So we were a little bit ahead of ahead of our time, but uh, we gained the momentum because we were prepared um, Jan 1, 2014. And next thing you know, uh, Washington follows Oregon, California, so all these states. And for the most part, they all have strict regulation around packaging. So that's been a core staple of our business, selling packaging. We've also expanded into selling the vape pens themselves, the cartridges, empty. And then we uh, bought a company that, sold, uh, that sells the solvents. So you're talking about ethanol, uh, butane, propane that's used for the extraction of cannabis oils and concentrates. So we provide those to our customers as well. So when you think about our customers, it's any operator in the cannabis industry that's uh, growing, processing, packaging, branding these products, they're going to be buying supplies from us to be able to help them go to market and most importantly, go to market in a compliant fashion. So they're doing the right thing and they're able to hopefully have their brand uh, stand out a little bit from the competition because of our emphasis around customization and innovation. So that's the thesis of Kushko and, and we've grown the business tremendously as, as I'm sure you, you know, uh, you know, from when uh, 2014 when I officially became CEO, uh, we were only doing a few million dollars in sales and last year we did 149 million. So when people think of these, you know, packaging vials, right, and I have one here that, that that stores my uh, my paper clips. You know these are cheap, but they add up, and uh, this industry is only getting bigger. So we see a potential to continue to grow this thing. Absolutely, and I will say this: um, while the government goes out of their way and the regulators go out of their way to make sure that the packaging is childproof, the challenge to container manufacturers like yourself is to deal with those old fart baby boomers like myself who have arthritic fingers and can't open up the damn childproof containers, okay? It hurts my fingers sometimes to work those things. Um, however, I, do, I have seen a lot of uh, progress in that department too, and I'm sure you, you're, you're certainly aware of that too. Yeah, absolutely. And, and there's actually, uh, when you look at the uh, federal regulation around its uh, title 16 CFR 1700, it actually not only deals with children under the age of five, uh, but it also deals with seniors over the age of, I think, 55. So you test both groups. So on one hand, you don't want the kids to be able to open it. But on the other hand, you need uh, old, older generation to be able to open it as well. So it's a fine line. And people say child proof. Unfortunately, uh, these a lot of these packages, the vast majority, are not, it couldn't be considered child proof but you have a very high degree, like 97%, 98% that a child will not be able to access it. So still the message is, you know, be responsible in your own home, put, put these products out of reach of kids, but God forbid there's a mistake and something's left on the ground, uh, hopefully these packages will prevent any accidental ingestion. Puts a little more pressure on being a parent, which is by far the toughest job any of us have ever had to deal with. Uh, are you a father by any chance? It's funny that you ask because I'm, uh, I'm celebrating my son's first birthday on Wednesday. And, oh. uh, you know, I agree. I've been a CEO for, 
you know, six years now and, and being a father for this last year is, is much tougher job and, and much more rewarding too. So it's, it's been phenomenal. And one of the good blessings for me, uh, with, uh, with COVID, you know, being able to spend more time at home and, and at this critical age. So it's, you know, there's, there's pros and cons of what we're all going through right now. Absolutely. And there's no bigger challenge for a parent than to chat and talk with their children about adult activities. And while we always say, we got to be careful, we got to keep it away from the kids. All I know is a lot of times those who think we need to keep it away from the kids their kids know more about the product than they do, okay? This is half the problem, okay? It's about education. Look at Europe, just for a second, and, and I'm gonna move it over to alcohol for a second. There are fewer alcoholics in Europe because the European culture will in, introduce alcohol, wine, beer, early on in their ages to explain to them, this is what it does to you, and, you know, we're not telling you not to do it, but if you do it, you have to do it responsibly. That, to me, is far better than don't do this until you're 21 years old because, you know, it's going to rot your brain. Now, as you can tell, I'm pretty passionate about this stuff, okay? But you as a parent will have those conversations in a few more years, and hopefully you'll remember this old guy from Boston warning you about that talk. But I will tell you, Caffeine is the most addicted drug in our society today, and nobody seems to worry about that, right? Right. Um, you know, it, there was a great song by the Jefferson Airplane, uh, Go Ask Alice. You know, the ones that mother give you don't do anything at all. Meanwhile, Big Pharma dictates a lot of stuff, what happens in our medical community here. There's a lot of problems with medicine and health in this country. And here comes along a plant, a plant, people. Okay, if you know anything about plant medicine or even plant diets, they're so far superior to what most of us have grown up on. Look into that. In the meantime, um, Nick, I want to get back to our discussion and talk a little bit more about uh, fighting that stigma that all of us have to fight on a daily basis. And as a now, we, uh, I mean, are, is your company considered big business or are you still a small business? How do, how do they, that, I love the definition of small businesses, by the way. Well, it depends who's asking, right? Um, right. But, <laughs> you know, the, the reality is, I mean, most people look at us as, as more corporate cannabis, right? We're, you know, over a hundred million dollars in sales and we're publicly traded, but we only have 125 employees. So we still are pretty uh, close in terms of being more of a small company feel. And we're all very passionate uh, about the industry. So you know, I think that's what that's what separates us. But, you know, you, you brought up a lot of good points uh, with uh, how things are treated differently. And I think when we think about stigma, that's going to be the hardest thing uh, to change. I think the laws will change. Right. And we, we can we can get this thing to be fully legal um, here in the next few years, I believe. But it's going to take far longer for the stigma to change.
by the time your child is 21, hopefully by that time, how's that? Yeah. And, it, and by the way, as a father of an adult child who's turned 30 in September, um, there is a lot of rewards as a parent throughout the first few years. And then the challenges of the 10 to 14 and then the teenager years come through. But when they finally get to the point where they are adult children and they understand the sacrifices that you as a parent have given for them, there's, it, it's like so enlightening. It's so wonderful. <laughs> it's like, you know, welcome to the club, kid, you know? Yeah, you- That's the light at the end of the tunnel. Too. That's right. That's exactly, that's exactly right. Um, I want to ask you about COVID. As a guy who runs a company with a number of employees, um, we had a great interview uh, about a month ago with two legends of the game. Uh, one is Joe Lasardi. He's the CEO of Curaleaf, the largest MSO. They're, they actually are based here in Massachusetts. And the other is Bruce Linton, who helped build Canopy Growth into a huge company. And they both talked about how COVID has kind of taught this society that we can actually do business and keep your businesses going remotely and what kind of an effect that might have down the road on getting into office space and how you actually do business. Have you, what are, what are the kind of challenges you've had in your own operation as far as keeping it going under the COVID restriction? Yeah, you know, uh, we're all learning and adjusting and certainly I have a lot of respect for both those gentlemen. I know them well, Bruce and, and Joe. And uh, you know they're 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 the best of the best. So they they've got far larger uh, teams than I do. But you know we're we're doing a lot. We've um, you know been reacting to obviously what the state's uh, guidelines are, what the rules are. We have two components to our business. We have uh, you know our office team, right, which would include everybody in, in the corporate suite, HR, finance, uh, legal, sales. Um, and then we have our operations team, which, you know, they're in the warehouse and cannabis has been deemed essential virtually in every state, except for one. I'm not going to uh, <laughs> call out which one it was. Uh, but oh, it no, you can. Uh, <laughs> and luckily, they're, you guys are back online now. But, uh, yes. you know, we've been able to, to uh, navigate uh, by saying, hey, we're going to de-risk and, and take the corporate staff that doesn't necessarily need to be in the office, let them work from home and create an environment that's safe for our warehouse crew that does need to be in the, in the warehouse shipping orders. And uh, it's worked out well. We've also looked at how we potentially uh, reopen the office, how, you know, how, when and how. And, you know, we have uh, a plan for that, which includes, um, you know, bringing people back in phases. It includes, um, you know, health uh, temperature checks and, and um, you know, certain surfaces are being cleaned more often than others. Uh, you know, mask requirements, you know, hand sanitizer, you know the drill. So there's a lot that goes <laughs> into it, but I think the biggest takeaway from, you know, from me and, and a lot of CEOs that I've spoken with is just, you know, the, the need to work in an office. It, it's not as necessary. And, you know, it's interesting when you think about hiring because we, we uh, just identified a few roles that we're going to hire for. Uh, before I would have said, well, they need to be here and they need to be there. And now it's like, well, I'd like it to be there, but if there's a great candidate that's not there, we, they can work remote, right? Because we, right. we're in a new world. So I think, you know, and we're just, we're, we're not a tech company. I think we're, we're at the one end of the spectrum. We're starting to embrace that. You know, the other end of the spectrum, you know, companies are moving to that full bore, right? There's going to be virtual offices all over the place and we'll never return to, to, what, we, to what we had, um, in my opinion. So it, it's changing everything. And you know, one of the things that I tell my team here and, and something that uh, you, you certainly are going to be embracing, anyone in the cannabis industry, is change. Change right. is constant. Um, we've seen it uh, you know, almost 10 years now. This industry has changed you know, three or four times over. And now uh, our whole society is changing with what's happening with coronavirus. So you just gotta embrace the change and you gotta, you gotta go attack it and you're gonna make mistakes and you're gonna learn from those mistakes and you're gonna adjust. And that's uh, what being in business is all about. Adapt, improvise, plan, and make it up as you go along because it does change almost on a weekly, if not monthly basis, right? Exactly. Hey, one last, one last question, because I know you were um, an athlete, okay? You were an academic All-American at Southwest Baptist University. How does sports prepare you for a leadership role 
in business? Yeah, it's, I think it's great uh, preparation, right? Number one, um, you know, if you play sports at a high level, you know, it, it's not just showing up to a basketball game, right? Uh, it, it, it's a full-time job. Number one, you, your training is very serious. Um, your practice, very, you do film sessions, so you actually study, uh, you know, what, what you've done in the performance uh, arena, and, and you learn from that. And, and, and you're really, um, you're a team, so there's this aspect of, of the culture, right, which is very applicable to the business world. Um, and then ultimately, you're competing. You, you're going out to win. And so, you know, I take that same uh, approach to the business, right? I want to have a, a company culture that feels like a team, uh, the camaraderie, uh, but also pushing each other, challenging each other. I want people to take the same level of dedication and preparation, um, you know, the pride in, in, in their talent and in, in their chosen field, right? And then ultimately, we want to go out and win. Um, we we want to go out and compete for business, and we want to win, and we want to deliver results. Um, so it's very similar, and, um, you know, I think it's a lot of that drive that has inspired me to, to you know, not only start this business, several other businesses. And, um, you know, again, we're still at the, we're still at the early stages. So, you know, I see a big vision for our company in this industry uh, over the next 10, 20 years. And, you know, all of that is, it, it reminds me of, you know, being a young athlete and thinking about, you know, going to the playoffs and winning championships and the tournament. And, uh, you know, it's exciting. And that's what gets you up every day. And, uh, you know, I think that, I wouldn't want it any other way, right? This is this is the 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 new playing field for me, and the the grass is uh, arguably greener. <laughs> That's right, or different colors these days, uh, if you know what I'm saying. Um, so, so Nick, uh, I so appreciate you taking the time. Uh, your PR team did a great job of, of hooking us up, and I think for good reason. I enjoyed this conversation. I hope we get to continue it offline at some point. Um, so you are always welcome in Massachusetts uh, to visit. Happy to uh, show you around my hood because uh, after all, it did all begin here, but I can say that life has certainly flourished in California. Okay, I certainly get that too. Uh, well, you so know, we have, a, we have a facility in Worcester and yep. uh, when things open back up, I'm gonna head your way and, and we'll get together. We'll hopefully be able to enjoy uh, a nice cannabis beverage. Well, there you go. And uh, we are on Worcester Street in Wellesley, Mass., which is west of Boston. So easy to find. But more importantly, um, Worcester is also the home for the Cannabis Control Commission, uh, as well as a number of dispensaries. So it's almost becoming the, the center of cannabis in the state of Massachusetts. So um, certainly uh, I look forward to that. I, I also know a few good restaurants in that area as well. So. Nick Kovacevic from Kushko. Uh, I so appreciate you taking the time and I look forward to uh, more things from Kushko down the road. So for Nick, I'm Jimmy Young, the host of In the Weeds. Remember, it's a whole new world of weed out there. Use it responsibly. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We Talk Now, We Talk News, and In the Weeds are all available on most major podcast distributors like iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and our friends at clnsmedia.com and our flagship, cannabis.net. So subscribe, share, and like our videos on all the social media networks out there, including LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, The Weed Tube, and YouTube. Weed Talk and In the Weeds are two productions of Pro Cannabis Media supported by Revolutionary Clinics, one of the top medical cannabis dispensaries in the Massachusetts area. Now with three locations in Greater Boston, two in Cambridge and one on Broadway in Somerville. Rev Clinics has a patient first mission. They will customize your needs as a medical patient with the proper titration and combination of strains, flavors, and products. Rev Clinics, where the patient comes first. We are Pro Cannabis Media.